All right, well, welcome everybody. And thank you for, uh, let's see, oh, I got this, oh, turn this off. There we go. All right, so, um, hope that worked. If it didn't work, I'll try again later. But we just took a tour through the House of Horrors, and um, hope th hopefully that worked for you. Hopefully you were able to take the tour with me. It's a really great place. It's a lot of fun. Uh, inspectors visit the InterNACHI headquarters, which houses the uh, House of Horrors. Um, just about every day we have visitors coming, and they just want to go through, and you can go through it. Um, there's a lot of defects in the house. You could bring your software, bring your checklist, and go through the house, and we have all the answers, so you can kind of test yourself. Um, and it's a, it's a lot of fun. This is Natchi TV. I'm Ben Gramico from InterNACHI, and it's January 25th. And um, Natchi TV is where you go for free, live, online classes. So they're live, but they're also video recorded, so you can watch it later. Um, and this class is about how to perform a home inspection according to a standards of practice, but we talk about a lot of, a lot of other things business and marketing strategies, and anything else you want. So if you f have a question, feel free to ask the question. And um, there should be like a, a little text area, a question area, a field area, where you can type in your questions. And um, feel free. Um, and you can ask those questions, and I'll try to get to them. So the... Um, we had about 300 students register for the class, and the class starts in about five minutes. So while we're here waiting for everyone, grab a cup of coffee. And again, this class is being video recorded, so you can watch it later. If a call comes in to do a home inspection, go for it. You can all hear me and see me, hopefully. It didn't get disconnected. All right, so there we all are. And that's what the question looks like, the field. So I'll be looking down and taking a look to see if you're asking questions or not. I'll try to pay attention. All right, thanks, Skip, for telling me. Good. Um, let's see. If you are a non-member and you're registered to attend this class, uh, feel free to email me and join InterNACHI at a big discount, 50% off. So that's 50% off the yearly fee. The yearly fee is $4.99, and so you get half of that off. And that's for non-members only who want to join InterNACHI who are attending this class. Now, um, you can go month to month as well. That's what I actually recommend. Um, sign up with InterNACHI at, at a monthly fee, $49 a month. Cancel any time. Um, if you're not a member, you can just try InterNACHI out see what happens, see if you like the courses. If you join InterNACHI for $49 for an entire month, for an entire month you have access to everything an InterNACHI member has. So a whole world of opportunity opens up for you for an entire month for $49. I would join, take some courses, take advantage of some membership benefits, try them out, see if um, some inspection leads come in. You have to be certified to do that. Um, but the courses, I would definitely take the courses. See if you can get a certificate of completion, pass the final exam, take our home inspector exam, test things out for a month. If you like it, great. If you don't, no harm. But if you wanted to join for a year and take advantage, well, there's a 50% discount. Just email me, um, ben at internachi.org. And we're going to inspect this house. I inspected this house. This house is in a cold climate in Pennsylvania. And uh, we'll go through the whole thing, and I want to show you how I inspect the house. But along the way, we can talk about all kinds of things, like marketing, standards of practice, business, things like that. One other thing I wanted to tell you about is that the InterNACHI School is accredited by the National Accrediting Agency of the U.S. Department of Education. 
So that's a recent thing. You may not have heard it, but everything that InterNACHI does, like the home inspector exam, it's accredited. The home inspector courses, they're accredited, all of them. The home inspector certificate program, that's accredited. So if you want to send yourself somewhere, I would go to a school that's accredited by the U.S. Department of Education. How do you know if your school or organization is accredited, recognized by the U.S. Department of Education? Go to ed.gov slash accreditation. ed.gov slash accreditation. Let me go there now. I'll show you. And it looks like this. So this is the U.S. Department of Education. And here's the question. Is my school accredited? If it's not accredited, why would you send yourself to an unaccredited school? Um, let's say, um, so this is the database of accredited post-secondary education institutions and programs. Um, Harvard, maybe you want to go to Harvard, right? Let's see if Harvard is listed. Yes. So Harvard is recognized, accredited by the U.S. Department of Education as an institution, right? Uh, let's say, uh, let's go back, um, Penn State. Penn State. Let's see. Oh, yep, Penn State's there. Boom. University, um, they have an institution, right? So let's go, well, my favorite school is InterNACHI. Type in InterNACHI, boom. So InterNACHI school is right there, and it's accredited as an institution. So that means everything that an InterNACHI school does, examinations, courses, certifications, online education, continuing education, it's all accredited. So um, don't send anyone to an unaccredited school. And if, you, if your state um, recognizes an unaccredited school, you should probably file some kind of uh, complaint. Tell them that you want your state to recognize truly accredited institutions. Performing a home inspection is fairly straightforward. It really is. You can gain all the knowledge that you need to perform every task required to perform a home inspection online through InterNACHI's nationally accredited courses. What's difficult is staying in business. <laughs> so you should think about yourself not as a home inspector, but as a business owner, a successful business owner who just happens to offer home inspections. You can offer mold inspections. You can offer HUD 203K inspections. You can work with FEMA and work with emergency uh, weather events. But to do that long term, you have to think of yourself as a business owner, right? Are you with me? Are you all with me? Just checking. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let me pull up the questions. Okay. Feel free to ask questions. So again, we're going to inspect this home, but Related to business and marketing, where do you find those business and marketing strategies, tips, successful, proven strategies? Well, we just finished a class, just like this one, on NACHI TV. So go to nachi.tv and um, do a little clicking, a little button click, and do a search for business and marketing. And this is the first slide here. And uh, we had a lot of fun making fun of this poor fella. Um, the point was, if you want to be successful as a home inspector, you have to be successful as a business owner. And if you are just starting off, starting your business, you want to think about not watching TV at night for an hour, but working instead on your business. And if you spend one hour a night if you calculate it, by the end of the year, you're about six weeks in front of your competition. Imagine being six weeks ahead at the end of the year. Only by putting a little bit of extra time each night working on your business and your marketing. So we can go over that in this class if you'd like. But we had a really great business and marketing class. Over a thousand inspectors uh, attended the class. It was really good. So let's talk about how to perform a home inspection. We can talk about software, writing reports, business strategies, scheduling, hiring inspectors, branding, marketing, websites, calculating profitable fees, not just guessing what you should 
charge your potential clients, but how do you calculate a really profitable fee so that when your phone rings, you know that this is going to be a successful phone call? All you really have to do is just say, yes, I'm available, and they know your price, and if they don't, you tell them the price that is profitable to you. You're not just guessing. Um, one of the things that I like is when you're in business and you start to have fun, you can, the really fun part in business is the marketing stuff, right? The business stuff is, you know, some basic things. We all, there's, there are no secrets to running a successful business, actually. It's just a matter of trying a few things, getting your foundation right with your agreements, your contracts, your software, your, your systems, put systems in place that work for you, like online scheduling. And then you have fun with um, marketing and trying to beat your friendly competition. And one of the things that I always recommend is um, getting a home maintenance book. This is one, I've done this since, I don't know how, it's gotta be 20 years now. We've had these home maintenance books, they work. That's why. If they didn't work, we wouldn't have them. So you can get a custom home maintenance book. This is one specifically for Florida. So if you're in Florida, Internachi has a home maintenance book just for Florida. It's titled, Now That You've Had a Home Inspection, dot, dot, dot. Why? Because if anything happens after your home inspection, now that you've had a home inspection, the responsibility is yours, homeowner, right? So the whole, this isn't just about how to maintain a home. It helps reduce your liability as well. And within these pages, um, there are about a dozen reasons, really good reasons to hire you again. Um, and then this is the office copy. You write office copy on it and then you put it in a real estate office so that no one throws it away. And inside, or you can put a sticker here or on the back, there's room for a sticker or inside like this. You can put your business card so that people know where to hire you. Or you can just customize. And there's a Spanish one. We have one in, in Spanish for your Spanish-speaking clients. And then you can customize them. So these are fully customized. This is quality home inspections. Um, you can tweak the title if you want and the color. And there's pictures, right? There he is, Daniel. And the interior is full color as well. And we just came out with a new price. If you buy 250, they're $3.50 each. If you buy 1,000, they're $2.70 each. Wow, that costs a lot. No, not really. If you're charging $300 for an inspection, charge $310. And have your client, this is overhead, right? This is on every inspection, this is now overhead. So don't pay for it. Have your potential client pay for it. Have your client pay for it. Tell them that they are going to receive this if you hire me. If you hire me, you're gonna get a lot of information from me, not only just at the inspection, because I invite you to walk with me and ask questions while we're going through the inspection. It was a two, three hour inspection, but I'm gonna give you information on top of that so you can maintain the home that we just inspected. Your beautiful dream home needs to be inspected. So I'm gonna help you out with that with additional materials just like that. Don't charge extra for it, just increase your fee to cover the overhead cost. I never paid for anything. I allowed my clients to pay for it, right? I never paid for, essentially, my infrared camera. Here's a FLIR C2. I raised my fee and allowed my clients to pay me for using the infrared camera on every inspection. Because an infrared camera makes, makes it easier to do an inspection. Infrared cameras, helps home inspectors perform better inspections. It's basically the truth right there. And so, oh, there we go. Oh, let's see, can you see that? Oh, wait, here we go, boop. Let's see if I can get this to work. Technology, right? Yeah, there's my fingers. So an infrared camera, this one is the cheapest one that's really good. Um, there's one that attach to your phone, but my phone is a business phone. I need to grab it and answer phone calls. 
while I'm doing inspection and schedule stuff. I don't have time to attach things. When you attach the, uh, I think it's called the FLIR 1 to the phone, it, it can't fit in my pocket anymore. What's the point of that? So this one fits in my shirt pocket. It's the FLIR C2. And here's my hot cup of coffee, right? And what it does is it senses temperature differences. So it looks at just surfaces. This is an x-ray. It doesn't see through walls. It just sees the temperature of the surface of the thing that you're looking at. Why is that important? Well, you could see in the summertime, if there's missing insulation in the walls, you can see the studs and the insulation and the heat signature uh, on the interior surface of the, of the home. And take a look at that. There's also some tricks that you could mess yourself up with. So right there is a, um, a window and that's glass and you could kind of see a ghost in the window, see me waving. Um, so that's a reflection. So you may say, oh, uh, something's wrong over there. It's, something's hot. It's actually just me in the reflection of the, so don't mess yourself up. If you're gonna grab one of these and use it during a home inspection, you have to get trained on how to use an infrared camera and interpret what you're seeing, right? And it's really nice when things are cool, like groundwater that intrudes or comes into the basement. Um, so let's see, here's a, here's a, um, like a bottle of water. You really can't see the any temperature difference. But what it actually can do is um, just shows up like that. Isn't that cool? So why is it different in temperature? Well, darker is cooler and water coming from the ground is cooler. So there could be a, a spot there on the floor that has water penetration. I would not be able to see it without it. I mean, I could use a flashlight. And Fred camera is kind of like a flashlight. It allows me to see things that I wouldn't normally be able to see without it. An infrared camera is the same. It allows me to see things that I wouldn't normally be able to see without it. So that's um, a water stain of, of some kind there. But I'm gonna keep my mouth shut until I actually use a moisture meter and confirm that it's wet. Because some things are just cool, right? So if, it's, if I see it with my infrared camera, which I can scan a, an entire room in two seconds and then confirm it with my moisture meter, then I'm doing a better inspection. And I think this is about $450 or $500 from um, our e-commerce partner, inspectoroutlet.com, inspectoroutlet.com. You can grab one of these. So I highly recommend getting an infrared camera, but don't pay for it. What I did personally as a business owner is I raised my fee because I was adding value to my service. This adds value to my service because I'm a better inspector and I perform better inspections and I write better inspection reports because of my infrared camera. I can find things that no other home inspector can find if they don't have an infrared camera. There's no way you can see. Why would you hire someone who can see what anyone else can see? You hire someone who can see things that no one else can see. I can, I can tell that that is, there's something there, some water intrusion there. So, increase your fee. I went from 329 to 369, and I paid for that camera within a few months. Um, so that's kind of like a, a strategy, right? A business strategy, but it also incorporates branding and marketing into that. So just about everything you do as a business owner combines your knowledge, your skills, marketing and branding and business all into one. Hey, we're having a national convention. We had one in Atlantic City. A thousand inspectors showed up in Atlantic City and we're having one in Boulder, Colorado at InterNACHI headquarters and the fairgrounds nearby, and it's free. All of our conventions, annual conventions, are free. There's no need to pay to go to a home inspector convention. I would never go to a home inspector convention where you have to pay, right? This is free because of our fantastic vendors and exhibitors. We have the best exhibitors and vendors and sponsors from all over the world coming to this fair and they'll have a table or two or three there to talk to you specifically about it. But we have a free 
fair um, because of our vendors and exhibitors. So everyone's going to be there. We're expecting 1,000 people. We've got to cap it at 1,000, just like we did in Linux City, maybe a few more. We're going to have some, a lot of fun. Um, so please go to nachi.org slash convention. And speaking of tools, infrared tools, um, this is one of my favorites. Do you know what this is? It's actually a moisture meter. See the pins? So there's two pins, and this end has a little light, and there's some sound. And if, it's, um, if something is wet, it just tells you. So I could go over there to the carpeting, go through the carpeting into the padding, and if there's something damp on the floor, I can confirm it. Also, I can reach a tall ceiling with this thing, or I could reach out through um, a floor joist and touch the band joist behind um, the deck attachment, right? To see if something is wet. This is called the Hydro Shark. And I can only find one place that sells the Hydro Shark, and it's Inspector Coach. And I know the Inspector Coach. Um, she's a great coach. So if you go to Inspector Coach, might as well go there. I know my, my windows keep popping up over here. So there's Alicia. She's the Inspector Coach. You click Inspection Tools, and there's the Hydro Shark. So you can get the Hydro Shark right there. Have Amazon ship it to you. But there's also flashlights, GFCIs, AFCIs, voltage testers, personal safety equipment, tool bags. Every tool you might need to do a home inspection is right there, even software. And, but the really good thing is the downloads. I would click the free eight-step checklist. If you're not sure what to do or what to do next or how to get started in your business or just need a little bit of a boost, make sure you're doing everything you can in your business to be highly successful and profitable, um, there's an eight-step checklist and it's free download from inspectorcoach.com. And check out that, um, that tool page. Another place for a resource is uh, a step-by-step -step checklist for success at nachi.org slash everything. nachi.org slash everything. Go there and there's 15 steps. You scroll down the entire page do all the steps and all the sub-steps in between, and uh, you'll see it's, it's a pretty thorough checklist. This is the reason why we're in business, because not every house has a major defect. Real estate agents love to hear that, too. And my clients love to hear that, too. Your dream home doesn't have to be you know, in terrible shape. Because not every home, it's, a, it's true, not every home has a major defect, but some do. And most homeowners don't know what a, doesn't know, they don't know what a defect looks like. They don't know what to look for, right? You do. That's why every home should be inspected every year. In the United States, we have this census survey thing going on every few years and we collect data on our homes. And 15 million of our homes, there's, um, what is it, about 200 million homes in the United States? 15 million of them have signs of mice, rats, cockroaches in the last 12 months. Now as a home inspector, you're not required to inspect a lot of things. There's only a few things, really, almost a handful of things you're required to inspect as a home inspector, according to the standards of practice. You're not required to look for rodents and mice and cockroaches. However, I exceed the standards of practice, which is okay. If you apply that standard, that um, if you exceed the standards of practice for all of your clients, um, if I see a mouse trap, I'm going to take a picture of it and put it in the report and ask my client to ask the seller about mice in the home. If I see signs of cockroaches and things like that, right? Over a million homes have holes in the floor. And over a million homes have holes in the roof. <laughs> if you line the two holes up, that's not a good scenario for, in a rainstorm. There are literally holes in roofs and floors. That's why you have a home inspection. Almost 10 million homes have water leaks coming from something like a clogged drain or a broken pipe or water meter, water heater. Six million homes have roof problems. 
you're require, you are required to inspect the roof covering material according to the standards of practice as a home inspector. You can do it from the roof, but that's exceeding the standards. You're not required to walk upon any roof surface. Stay safe. I wouldn't go up on any roof if you weren't trained or experienced. It's hazardous. It's fatal. A fall from a roof is fatal, so don't, you're not required to walk upon any roof surface. It's really dangerous. But if you do go up, you may see one of these problems because six million of our homes in the United States have roof leaks, active roof leaks. A couple million homes had toilets that didn't work in the last three months. None of the toilets, and we have over two million homes where none of the toilets worked. You know, we also had clogged sewer drains. We have a hands-on training class to become a certified sewer scope inspector where you shove a camera in a line down the sewer line. That's a good service, ancillary service. <clears throat> um, almost 10 million homes have electrical problems and almost two and a half million homes have defective heating systems. And what about mold? Speaking of water intrusion, like over there, millions of homes have signs of mold growth. How do you inspect for all these things, like mold, sewer lines, water leaks, moisture intrusion? InterNACHI, nationally accredited school, accredited by the U.S. Department of Education, has over 45 different types of certifications. These certifications are essentially additional to your home inspector certification. They're ancillary inspections, and ancillary inspections is where profit is. Because you go to a home, and you do a home inspection, but an ancillary inspection shouldn't take up more time. So if you can add an additional service, you're adding value and you can charge more. The more value you add, the higher fee you can demand. Higher value it means higher fees. And if you are profitable doing a home inspection in three hours with your home inspection fee, adding an ancillary service that doesn't add time should be very profitable to you. So profit for a home inspector is in the ancillary additional services that adds value to your bundle home inspection service. Yeah? In general, you want to think of, um, you want to think of a, a fraction, and like in math. The top numerator of the fraction is the amount of money that you can make divided by what? Your time. So what you want to do is you want to increase gross revenue as much as possible and divide it by a small, small, small amount of time. You don't want to spend all day performing a home inspection. If it takes eight hours to perform a home inspection, you're only making this amount of money. That ratio isn't very good. That long division, I don't like. What you like is where you have a lot of money at the top and you divide it by a certain amount of time at the bottom. So what does that mean? Well, you have to increase your gross revenue. So it's somewhere you're calculating profit, right? Your basic home inspection, you add additional fees, ancillary inspections, adding value. You can, that's profit. You can add that, right? Um, if you're not adding to your time, right? A lot of money, small amount of time. That means you want to be efficient with your time. You want to inspect a home well. So you have to get trained and certified through the InterNACHI school. Every home should be inspected every year. And if you are a home buyer watching this video, go to inspectorseek.com, inspectorseek.com, and find a home inspector in your area. Let's say you inspect a home in San Francisco that was built in 2009. That's not too long ago. That's 10 years ago. The Code back then for ceiling insulation, that's insulation, let's say I'm on the second floor in a bedroom, I'm looking up at the ceiling. Ceiling insulation is the insulation above the surface, the drywall, right? How much is in that space in between the finished room and the unfinished attic, let's say. Ceiling insulation was R30. The so R value is related to the thickness in the material and things like that. For the walls, it's R13. But in 2018, which is just last year, building code changed. And now the R value is R38 for the ceiling insulation. 
in R20. That's a difference of 21%, roughly, about a quarter difference. So if I was inspecting a home in 2019, and I know the home was built in 2009, I inspect a home regardless of the age. It's a lot easier for me. And I see that there isn't a whole lot of insulation. There's like a lack of insulation by about 20%. That's a defect, in my opinion, as a home inspector. If you inspect a system and almost a quarter of it is defective or missing, wouldn't you call that a defect? Yeah. So there are a lot of homes out there. Think of all the homes that were built in the past 10 years in your area. Have the codes changed? See, we're not, we're home inspectors, we're not code inspectors, but we use code in order to perform a really good inspection and tell our clients what is good and bad, what needs improved, what could be done better, how to fix that, how to maintain, how to maintain it. So that's just a, an example of why every home should be inspected every year. Most homes have problems simply because the code has changed. So one of the things I really like is going to resources and learning how to perform a really good inspection based upon the technical data and resources that are available. And I like to incorporate all this stuff into my software, which I carry with me on my iPhone. So I have um, software, home inspection software. I have Home Gauge, Home Inspector Pro, Spectora, 3D. They're all on my mobile devices. And I, br I can bring data and really technical information onto my phone so I never look stupid, right? I always have the information that I need. Um, and so if you click this link, um, the slides will be available on Etchy TV. So I want to go to Energy, uh, Department of Energy, energy.gov, and the Building America Department, and they talk about climate zones. So in the United States, I'm familiar mostly with the United States, there are eight climate zones, seven main ones, there's a subarctic one in, in certain parts of um, um, uh, Alaska. But um, there's this link to a guide to determining client, uh, climate regions. Oh, let's see. Let's see if it pops up for me. There we go. So a guide to determining climate regions, um, climate zones. Um, and they have this guide here, and it's really good. There's a couple maps um, of the United States again. There are eight zones. Um, the eighth one is a subarctic zone um, in the United States, and it's in uh, certain parts of Alaska. But there are basically seven. Now, in my area, I live in Colorado. There are four climate zones in Colorado, four of them. Well, there's, a, there's three within like a uh, five-mile radius. And there's, there's three that, that touch each other. So, Depending on where you are, remember the home in San Francisco with the lack of insulation? Well, your recommendations to add insulation, it's kind of dependent upon knowing where you are. You're not just guessing. You could say, well, I don't think there's enough insulation to add more insulation. I don't know how valuable that is. You want to add value. You may want to refer to the zone that you're in. And what does, what does building construction standards say? What do, what does code say? What do, what do modern requirements have in store for you? So um, there's the IECC, that's the code climate zones, there, there's zones, and then there's the Building America, they call them not numbers, but um, it's subarctic, very cold, cold, mixed humid, mixed dry, hot humid, hot dry, and marine. Wow, that's cool. So I can figure out where my clim climate zone is in this document by typing um, San Francisco. So in San Francisco, um, there's one climate zone, it's marine, and it's climate zone three. What if I'm in uh, Boulder, Colorado? I type in Boulder, and uh, Boulder, Colorado is cold, climate zone five. Okay, so now I'm a home inspector, I'm inspecting a home, I know my climate zone, now what? Well, you go to the code, because code mentions climate zone. Like, what is climate zone? How do you apply this to being a great home inspector? Home inspector. Well, it's really cool. 
So you go to table R402, um, and you look at the left side here in climate zone, and there it is. So I confirm that the ceiling R value, I'm sorry, here's the ceiling R value for climate zone 5. There it is, 5, I go across. It's R49 for the ceiling. So I know that I can make a recommendation for more insulation based upon a guess, based upon uh, some kind of uh, code or some or what? Yeah, code. That's the modern code requirement for a home in this climate zone for ceiling insulation. I'm not a code inspector, but that is the requirement, right? And if it meets that requirement, then it's not defective. If 20% of it is missing, then I'm gonna call it out. That's why I enjoy not being a code inspector. That's terrible. I enjoy being a home inspector because I can comment on things like that without referring directly to the code. And I'm not a code inspector. I can make recommendations based upon what? Based upon code, but I'm not a code inspector. I don't have to know the code in great detail. Just this stuff. So that when I make a recommendation, it's not based upon guesses or some old class that I took 10 years ago or some old home inspector exam, unaccredited home inspector exam that I took 10 years ago based upon modern things. So what I do is, and what I recommend is, inspecting a home regardless of the age of the home and inspect it according to the most recent building standards code. Why? Because typically code changes because we know how to build something better or we're trying to save more lives, trying to make the home more comfortable and safe like spindles between, the space between railing spindles. Back then, a 20-year-old home, they allowed the babies to fall through that space between the railing spindles. Terrible. What'd they do? They shrunk that distance so that a four-inch sphere cannot pass through. So when I'm doing a home inspection on an old existing home, and most of the homes in the United States, most of them were built in the 70s and 80s. So they're old. And I come across a really nice banister, a railing, at a staircase, wood, original to the house, I'm gonna call it out. Because I know that we can't have children falling through. Right? And if there are no AFCI breakers, AFCI, uh, AFCIs at all in the house, that's 30 years old, I don't care what the real estate agent says about grandfathering. I want to protect people. I want to make the home safer. So my recommendations are based upon the most recent code, standard, best practices. So that's just an example. This is what we do as home inspectors. We're excited about <laughs> climate zones and codes and tables and R values and things like that. So that why? So that you can provide a really good service. So that people talk about you as an unpaid sales force. They're talking about you as a home inspector. What are they saying? Are they saying you make recommendations based upon guesses? He said, or she said put in more insulation. What does that mean? I don't know. How much? I don't know. Why? I don't know. So I never wanted to be embarrassed as a home inspector. So I dug deep into this kind of stuff. And this kind of information is in every InterNACHI online course, which is free and online to members. Why? Because in an, as an accredited school, we have to review every year our entire curriculum and make revisions and submit them to the U.S. Department of Education to be approved. If you are attending an unaccredited school or an unaccredited institution, they don't abide by those standards. Good luck. Ha, I like InterNACHI. Um, and here's a really good article about how insulation works. Oh, I don't know why my window keeps popping up on the wrong side. Here, I must be doing something. Um, it's from the Department of Education. Love the EPA. Love the Department of uh, Energy. Department of Energy, the Energy Department. Um, hope they stick around forever. Um, and it's about how insulation works. I actually reread this two or three times. And it's a really good article. 
I needed a good refresher about conduction and insulation. And what does insulation do? And what does thermal bridging mean? And why, do, when I use my infrared camera that we used before, earlier in the class, why can I see the studs in the wall? It's because thermal bridging. See, there's different ways that energy moves. And all energy moves from higher temperatures to lower temperatures. It's always moving in that direction. And if you want to resist that movement, you want to add some type of material, insulation material, to block that movement, essentially. And that's what insulation is. In relation to conduction, energy is um, leaving this, this area here. The heat that's on the ceiling is going up through materials, right? Going into the cold, especially in the wintertime, cold, unfinished attic space, unheated, unconditioned attic space. And so we want to stop that transfer of heat, that loss of heat. So we insulate the ceiling. To what value? In my climate zone, it's 49. How do I know that? Because I looked it up and I'm trained by InterNACHI. All right. And um, the R value is a measurement of how much resistance there are, there is in that material so that heat energy can't travel through. It's really cool. It's a really great article. So um, t take a look at that. I highly recommend going to those resources. Let's perform an inspection on this house. Let's see. Um, every home should be inspected every year, Carl says, for customer retention. Heck yeah. In fact, I recommend in another class when we talk about more like business operations, I, t I talk about how you can schedule your next year's inspection for every client. Every home inspector should be doing that. Every home inspector should be, when they schedule an inspection, schedule next year's inspection. If you schedule an inspection right now and pay for it right now, I'll give you a big discount, 50% off. I want to come back next year for only $100 instead of $200 and do an annual home maintenance checkup on your home. And if you schedule it right now and pay for it now, I'll give you $100 off. What are you doing? You're scheduling next year's jobs. For who? For all of your existing clients that already trust you and you're on the phone with them. Oh, such a great idea, right? By next year, you hire a new inspector who does all of your $100 annual home maintenance inspections. And you do the difficult work, the, the three hour home inspection jobs. It sounds like a great plan to me. If only I knew that when I was a home inspector, I'd be scheduling next year's jobs right now. Put that on your website. Um, Carl, let's see. Carl says, an old class can be as recent as before last year's recent code updates. An old class can be as recent as before last year's recent code update. I'm not sure. I think we agree. I just wanted to make the point that um, if a real estate agent says, well, that's grandfathered, I kind of laugh and giggle about that, right? I want to help people protect themselves. Like, uh, <laughs> all receptacles in the garage need to be GFCI protected. All receptacles in the laundry need to be GFCI protected. You know, code changes because someone got hurt. All bedrooms need smoke detectors. All hallways, all floors need smoke detectors, right? Why? Because we used to build homes with one detector per floor. That was in the code. Well, if I'm inspecting that home and I see an absence of smoke detectors in the bedrooms, I'm, uh, my ears just shut off and I'm focused on my client. And I want to tell my client, I know this home was built 30 years ago. It was built to code back then. But that doesn't mean anything. Right now, you need smoke detectors in every bedroom. So I just wanted to make that point. Um, and InterNACHI's courses, because we're an accredited school, is always being updated and revised. And I don't know of any other school that does that. It's not required, really, of any other school. Unaccredited schools 
operate unaccredited schools and unaccredited institutions and organizations operate by no standard. Here's my home inspection day. I did two inspections a day and I worked about nine, ten hours a day. And if you're running a business, that's about expected because, you know, this isn't, um, I'm not being employed. I don't have a job, I have a business. And the only reason to go into business is to make a great living. If you wanted to make a good living, you would get a good job. If you want to make a great living and be your own boss and do your own schedule and make a ton of cash and pay your bills and go on vacation and do other great things in the world, yeah, being in business is kind of cool. It's one way of doing it. And this is my schedule. So this is my actual schedule. I lived by this. And I made $1,000 a day, gross. And that was a lot of money. Bought a home, raised a family, went on vacation, had two cars, yada, yada. Seven o'clock, I leave my house because I want to get to job one early. If I can get there in 45 minutes, pick up a cup of coffee. Uh, if you're in the East Coast, it's Wawa. Um, pick up a coffee and go to job one and let's say I'm sitting there, right, 15 minutes early. I don't park in the driveway, by the way, I park on the street. Let my client take the driveway and what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to inspect the roof and the exterior. I'm going to ring the doorbell. Probably they're expecting me. No big deal. I'm a little early. Hi, I'm here to do the inspection. They won't be here for another 15 minutes. While I'm here, I might as well do the roof if you don't mind. I'm going to do the exterior too. Maybe take some pictures, is that okay? Yeah, okay, bye, okay. No big deal, client arrives at eight o'clock. I'm inspecting the exterior with them. At about 8.15, I go inside. Because the exterior, well, I'm gonna do the roof before they come, I'm gonna get there early. And I'm gonna do the exterior next. And I kind of introduce myself, give five business cards out, five. Pass them out, shake their hand, big smile. Uh, take a mint in your mouth, make sure you're clean and dressed up. First, you know, first time you're going to meet your client, first impressions, you never get that back. I invite them to walk around with me. I may take them around counterclockwise all the time, kind of like a skim of the exterior. I ask them to go inside if they want to go inside and do what they really want to do is take measurements and plan for renovations and all that stuff. Uh, first time home buyers spend about 10 to, well, eight to $10,000 within the first six months of moving into the home. So they're ready to, they've got their money out, they're ready to roll with renovations. That's what they really want to do. And all they want to know from me, in my experience, maybe they want to know something to, different for you, is, um, is there any reason not to buy the home? Is there a big hole in the roof, like we just saw in the housing data? Um, any signs of rats? or something like that. That's why I'm there. I'm there. They already found their dream home. They spent months finding this home, the right neighborhood, the right school system, the right real estate agent, the right bank, the right, oh, it just goes on and on. They've already been in the home. This is the second time or third time in. They've already signed. They have an offer. They've already signed. They're already pre-approved. And I'm, there's hardly anything I can say to ruin this deal. There's hardly anything I can say to kill this deal. Everything can be fixed. Hardly, you know, there's hardly anything. I've done inspections 15 years. I've a home inspector all my life. Hardly anything you could say to kill a deal, even though that's the, that's the phrase going around, right? We kill deals. We actually don't. So let her rip. If you see a defect, put it in the report. It's okay. I do the exterior with my client, maybe. They go inside. I do the exterior by myself, and I'm taking pictures. And I'm really inspecting. And I'm inspecting every system and component. Then I go inside and do the heavy lifting. I want to do heating, cooling, hot water source, plumbing, drain waste vent, water supply, and then do electrical panel and structure. At about 10 o'clock, I'm done with that heavy stuff. If I'm doing an inspection on the weekend, usually family members come. Uncle John comes. Aunt Mary comes and they're all around me and they're looking at me while I do the big stuff, the hot water tank, the structure, the electrical panel, some, some electrician is there, right? It's kind of intensive. But at 10 o'clock, I'm kind of, ah, uh, I'm done. 
I'm actually done with the inspection in my head. I gotta do the unfinished attic spaces, maybe there's a crawl space, maybe there's a garage. I do the interior, I flush the toilets, run the sinks, and I'm into the kitchen. I like to finish up in the kitchen because it's a nice place to, you know, do the summary of the report and people eat there and you know, sometimes there's coffee there or something. I don't, I don't eat. But you know, they're having a fun time in the kitchen area or something, sitting down at the table. It's amazing to be sitting down at the kitchen table with someone who just found their dream home. And you tell them, yeah, here's this problem, here's this problem, but you, know, that you can negotiate over it or get it fixed or something like that. That's what I recommend. You know? And since you're a neighbor, you know, I want to schedule the next year's inspection. I want to come back, make sure we maintain this home. Because I can see things that you don't, because you know, I have moisture meters and infrared cameras. I want to catch problems before they get really bad, right? Because we want to maintain your dream home. Ah, such a great opportunity to be in business. You're six months ahead of any contractor. A home inspector is in the position to influence a lot of money, a lot of decision making. So instead of recommending bling, you, home inspectors don't recommend granite countertops but that's in the mind of our clients. They want to put some granite countertops in. What you really want to do is help them understand that maybe you want to add more insulation, an air seal, right? Maybe you want to upgrade something. The HVAC system is getting a little old. Watch it, maybe you want to put that money away because in the next few years you're going to have to invest in a new HVAC system, something like that. You're in a great position to help people make good decisions. At 11 o'clock, I'm done. Remember, I left my house at seven. At 11 o'clock, I'm done with the first inspection and I should have at least 400 bucks in my pocket. $396 is what I started off with. I didn't charge, I didn't go crazy with this big table, difficult to understand based upon square footage and age and the amount of, 396 was our base price and then we simply over the phone said, where, where is it? Oh, that's 50 miles away. We're gonna have to charge extra for fuel. And they're like, okay, no big deal. Oh, it's f 100 years old? We charge a little bit extra because older homes have more problems. Oh, okay. It's 5,000 square feet? No, we usually charge for 3,000 square feet. If it's 5,000, we're gonna take a little bit extra time or have to charge extra. Those are the things. Distance, age, size. So we charge extra. But everybody knew it was, one basic price, about 400 bucks, you can get peach inspections. That was the company name. And then the ancillary inspections on top of that. I felt really bad as a business owner if all I did was a home inspection. Because I know uh, I'm a little bit behind, $396 to do a home inspection. That's great, but what I would really like is a radon and a termite inspection. That would be about 600 bucks. If I do that twice a day, that's a good business, right? So all of our inspectors in the company, the goal was to get that bundle package. Home inspection, radon, termite. It could be something different for you because you're in your climate or area. Uh, I don't think there is any radon in Florida, so that wouldn't work, right? But there's termites, there's mold, moisture intrusion, so, um, and there's stucco. So there's, oh, and there's wind mitigation. Down in Florida, hurricanes blow roofs off, so those roofs need to be strapped down onto the foundation. There's a service for that. Insurance companies love to see just four things, four point inspections. So in the South, there's different things in different areas. But the idea is to bundle. People love bundling things. So bundle your home inspection with a couple of ancillary services. Remember, we talked about this before in class. That is where profit is. If you increase your gross revenue, that's your goal, to increase gross revenue as much as possible, but at the same time, you're calculating what a profitable fee is. I bring an extra shirt, and I change my shirt in my truck, and I go get lunch, and at 12 o'clock, I'm at my next in inspection. Hopefully, I arrive early, and I'm scheduling these jobs geographically so that they're all kind of bundled together. Four o'clock, I'm back at the office, and I'm home. Done. You do that five, six times a week. Um, 
you are a successful business owner. For those ancillary inspections, go to natchee.org slash certification. So that's my profitable um, daily schedule. What is yours? What does yours look like? Is it one job? That's okay. But remember, you have to be, um, you have to manage your time. Time management is part of business. And remember that um, fraction we were talking about, that math, where money is on the top divided by your time. So you have to manage your time. Now when I do an inspection and I get there early, I think about rain. I was an inspector in Pennsylvania, we call it Pennsylvania, because it just rains all the time, especially uh, in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, it just rains. The whole state is just rain. And I think about how rainwater hits the roof, it's collected by the gutters, carried downwards, controlled by the downspouts, and diverted away from the foundation. And I think of flashing, I think of diverting, and slope, the slope of the roof, the slope of the ground, first 10 feet drops six inches. Everything's sloped away. That's what I think about when I approach a house, any house. And I try to inspect the roof first. So I'm there early and I inspect the roof. I get up on the roof. I exceed the standards of practice. Do not follow my footsteps, literally. It is a fatal fall from a roof. You could really kill yourself, break a leg, do a lot of things. If you fall off a couple rungs of a ladder, two rungs up, you could probably break a bone. So don't even use a ladder. You're not required to. You're not required to walk upon any roof surface. What if the roof is 12 feet up on a flat roof? Flat roof, 10 feet up. Not required to walk upon any roof surface. It doesn't matter. But here's the problem that you are going to have if you are in competition with me. I put that on my website and I put that in my inspection report because I know my inspection report is going to be passed around and read. And my inspection report, it's not an inspection report. My inspection report is the greatest marketing piece that I work on every day. And after you read my book, my greatest marketing piece, my home inspection report, at the end of the report, you should be thoroughly convinced that I'm the greatest inspector on the planet. You've got to hire me again. You have to talk about me. You have to tell your friends and your coworkers. You have, to, you have to be talking about me. You can't help it. It was such a great experience. When you hire me, you have such a great experience. And one of them is I am able to communicate the incredible value that you experienced by hiring me. That is a mouthful of value. <laughs> You're going to have a problem competing with me, right? How are you going to compete with me? This is the fun part of marketing. How are you going to compete with a, another inspector who walks upon the roof surface and finds stuff up there? Right? Do you use a drone? Do you use an extendable stick? According to the standards of practice, you're not required to walk upon any roof surface. What is the standards of practice? I would refer to the live link. Um, use the live link to refer your clients to the standards of practice. And you scroll down, you go to the roof section. There's the roof. Boop. What are you required to inspect? Well, the inspector shall inspect from ground level or the eaves. It's or, it's not and, or, or the eaves. Ground level, so I'll stay on the ground, please. All right, the roof covering materials, okay? The gutters, the downspouts, the vents, flashing, skylights, chimney, and other roof penetrations, and the general structure of the roof seen from other areas. The inspector shall describe what? The type of roof covering materials. Oh, okay, I can do that. What else? The inspector shall report as in need of correction. Uh, what? Everything? No. Observed, there is, observed indications of active roof leaks. Mm, what's an active roof leak? It has to be dripping. What if I just see stains? Well, I'm going to report it anyways. As a... As a an issue that my client has to ask the seller or the homeowner or the agent. Somebody has to know what's going on here. If I see water stains on the ceiling and I probed it with my hydro shark, 
which you can get <laughs> through uh, inspectorcoach.com, and it and it doesn't go off. It's quiet. There's no light. There's no sound. Um, I'm gonna. I'm not gonna say that's dry. I'm gonna say that's an active roof leak. I'm gonna side on my client. I'm gonna go on my client side, and I'm going to default to that's an active roof. I see observations. I have an observation. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm observing indications of an active roof leak. If that was an old leak, probably could have been painted up, right? I mean, if you have water stains on the ceiling, you should probably paint them before a home inspector comes, right? So I'm going to say that that is an active roof leak. If it's not, hey, great, that's great news, right? If it is, then it's a good thing that I reported it as a need of correction because that is the requirement of the standards of practice. When you perform a roof inspection, you have to report as a need of correction observed indications of active roof leaks, right? Okay. Bum, bum, bum. Let's go back up. There's the exterior section, and we could talk about what the um, home inspector is required to inspect in the exterior. There's just a lot of it. Um, for the exterior, <laughs> it says, the inspector shall report as a need of correction improper spacing, improper spacing between the um, intermediate balusters, spindles, and rails. We don't want children to fall through a deck railing. Um, so is that a code inspection? Uh, no, that's what a home inspector does. When I get up on a roof, I inspect every field, every plane, and I take up a lot of pictures. I'll be taking about 40 pictures up on the roof. Everything, all the vents, all the roof penetrations, all the surfaces. I put my hand on the roof. I try to estimate the age. It's okay. I could be way off. I'm just guessing. I'll tell my client. I'm guessing I could be way off. It could be brand new. It could be very old. I have no idea, but here's what I think. Roof penetrations, the flashing around the vent pipes. There's the ridge vent. So I know I have an unfinished attic space somehow underneath my feet. There's the pipes there. I have a fireplace chimney stack. Looks like a factory built. It's not masonry. The cap puddles up with water. You know, it's even in code that, that you know, the cap, the, it's supposed to be diverted away, right? Remember the rain? Uh, illustration we went over, everything is supposed to be diverting away. So you have to imagine if this wasn't wet, I could see it, was, it just rained and it actually has a little wet puddle there. But if it was bone dry, you have to keep in mind what happens during a rainstorm. You do not want puddles forming in areas that can uh, deteriorate a home, right? So the top of a rain, uh, uh, top of a chimney stack needs to be diverting water away and dripping away. And this isn't. So that's defect. That's OK. That's good. That's good. So I'm kind of touching everything. There's flashing where the chimney stack meets the house. There's a gable vent. So I'm identifying components. About half the work you do as a home inspector, home inspectors you know, identify things. So there's me pulling up the siding. It's a little tight, but it's vinyl. It's not wood. Um, I like to see a little clearance, but that's OK. I'm not gonna call it out, but I do see um, step flashing. The siding itself is the counter flashing. And there's one uh, layer of shingles on this roof, and I think it's a newer roof. This is a 35-year-old home, but um, there's only one layer, so it was replaced recently. Gutters are clean. I love that gutter shot. No defects. I don't see any problems with the shingles themselves. I'm back down on the floor, uh, on the ground, and I'm shaking my client's hand who just pulled up in the driveway at 8 o'clock. I also take video. Yeah, this is not a new thing, taking vi inspection videos during your home inspections. You really should do it, especially if your client um, isn't with you, right? And the way technology is going, I think, you know, a little video camera in your glasses, your work head glasses or a headband or something like that, you just tap it and you record video, uh, video and audio. 
that's probably the wave of the future. Right now, we have software that allows you to embed video that you took during a home inspection into the inspection report because it's cloud-based. So your software here, um, you type or tap the sentences you want in your inspection report, you snap pictures, and you snap video. You record video, and this sends it into the cloud, and when it's all done, this is a simplified version, when it's all done, you send a link to the report that's in the cloud to your client, and your client reads the report, and it's in the cloud. They don't download it as a PDF. Soon, PDFs will be old school. Who wants to look at a bunch of pages of pictures and text? They want interactivity, right? So when you are thinking about adding value to your inspection service and charging more, because you can demand higher fees when you increase the value, think about um, putting your report, delivering your report in innovative new ways, and that's a cloud-based report. You can have interactivity and video in a cloud-based report, and that is available today. Um, so choose your software wisely. What do, how do I describe defects? It's really up to you. There's only one type of defect that you are required as a home inspector, according to the standards of practice, to identify and put in the report, and that's material defect. A specific issue, uh, it's a defect that can really hurt someone or have an adverse impact on um, the value of the home. The other types that I um, identified, uh, other types of defects that I identified in my report are cosmetic. That's a superficial flaw, not really required to inspect it. You don't have to put it in the report, but I often do. My client will say, hey, is that a stain on the carpet? And I say, that is a stain on the carpet, and I put it in the report without like trying to argue about, oh, I don't inspect cosmetic defects according to the standards of practice. Really about. I just put it in the report. It takes a second. The other type of defect is minor, and that's a defect like a dirty air filter. It's a defect that can be corrected by the homeowner. A major defect is like a hole in the roof, and that needs to be corrected by a contractor. So that's the kind of defects. Because when you say this is a problem or a defect or it's serviceable, I have no idea what you're talking about. Is it a problem or not? Yeah, it's a problem. Okay, how big of a problem is it? I need to know the degree. My clients need to know, is this a little one, cosmetic, or is this a big one, material? And what are the things in between? Because it can't be just those, that or that. It can't be serviceable or not serviceable. What does that mean? I see that in the report all the time. You gotta stop using that. Tell them it's a problem and how big of a problem it is. Is it a little problem or a big problem? And who should fix it? Can I do this, air filter? Or do I need to hire a contractor? Hole in the roof. Eight o'clock, I'm done with the roof inspection. I'm also done with the roof inspection writing the inspection, and that section of the report, I'm done. My competition is going to be writing their reports at night. And I'll be working on the business, making my inspection report better, for example. How do I write the report as I inspect? You need a mobile device. You need to buy the right software that allows you to inspect and write as you inspect so that when I come off of the ladder, off the roof, I'm done with inspecting the roof. I know what's wrong with it. I've taken a ton of pictures. I've taken all my video, and I've written the report for the roof section. It's already written. So when I'm done with the roof, I'm done. I only have a few more systems left, right? And when I'm done with the, at 11 o'clock, when I'm done with my first inspection at 11 o'clock, I've written the report. I don't have to write the report. I don't have to write the report during lunch. I can enjoy my lunch. I can enjoy my dinner. I can enjoy my family at night. I can do whatever I want on the weekend. Because I'm done writing the report. I write the report as, that's time management. Remember, a lot of money at the top divided by your time. Don't be the business owner who has to work at night because they, they didn't invest in the right software because I don't know how to manage my time. I like the old school. I like getting a pencil and a paper and doing checks. Right, okay, I'm gonna beat you in the market because I provide value. Instant report summaries available 
right after the inspection is over. Boom, just like that. Yeah? Let me check a few things. Good? Okay. Oh, we have some questions. Hank says, hey. Hey, Hank. Terrence says, I need my website to be reviewed. I saw the inspector coach provides that service. Is there a link I can go for that? Yeah, it's inspector, inspector coach com. Oh, did I reply? Oh, send, send all. Yeah, inspectorcoach.com. And you click website review and you follow the instructions. Yep. Uh, but I would download, that's a really good service, but I would download the eight steps checklist off the downloads page first. Um, Terrence, what kind of challenges can I expect starting my business part time? Um, the challenge that you'll probably face is that you'll have a greater demand than you, than you can um, fulfill. That's the problem. Because if you put everything together, if you have a great website, if you got your marketing done, if you're an InterNACHI certified home inspector, you know, you join InterNACHI and become certified, one of the main reasons to become certified is that we flick on the switch on the internet and we send inspection job leads to you for free. You don't pay InterNACHI for these job leads. It's easy to do. I mean, I don't know why. Well, they're trying to make money. I don't know why other services charge for leads. But we send people on the internet looking for you. I'm looking for a home inspector, certified home inspector in Boulder, Colorado, around the 80304 zip code. I think InterNACHI will find that person and send that person to your website. So you better have a website. If your website stinks, that's your problem. You got to convert. And we teach a class on how to convert um, website visitors into clients. That's the problem you're going to have, being part-time. That's okay. You're going to have to figure out how to throttle the demand. So if you have everything in place, you're ready to go, you flick the switch, you can, it's, it's, um, it's not automatic. You can do it yourself. So you become certified in InterNACHI, boom, you flick the switch at any time you want. I want to be oh, on business. Your phone's going to ring. And you're going to have to schedule for what? It, you're going to do it um, on the weekends? That's fantastic. You know, that's how I started off. You know, my first home inspection was $300. No, was it $300 or $200? It could have been $200. It's $199. $200, like what, 20 years ago now, 25 years ago. $200 in three hours on a Saturday morning? At first, my wife was like, oh, you know. Come on, stay home, you know, the weekend. Uh. And I came back at noon with $200 in my pocket, and she was like, okay, let's go get some groceries. Start off on the weekends and just grow from there. And if you're already in a full time job, well, you know, you're going to have to balance it. But I would pump those weekends, man. I'd do two jobs on Saturday. If you can, do two jobs on Sunday to the point where you're choking with demand and then you flick the switch. You gotta go full-time business. In the meantime, there's other things to do. You can think of yourself as a manager. You know, you don't have to do any inspections to be a business owner that offers home inspections, right? You don't have to be a home inspector. I certainly would become trained and certified so that you can communicate to other home inspectors that you employ and manage. So the phone rings, you say, yes, we can do that job. You have a network of uh, home inspectors who are not that good at marketing and their phone isn't ringing, but you are. And you hire them to do your inspections. That's, if I had to do it all over again, I'd probably do more of that. I'd be more of a business owner. Because I made the fatal, not fatal, I made the mistake of thinking that there's no one else who can do a home inspection as good as me. Oh yeah, there is. Yeah, you might as well hire them and take a cut. Do a split, 70-30, it's pretty good. If it's a $400 job, I can't do my math. Person's making $300 a day, you're making 100 bucks, that's good. Schedule five of those a day. You're gainfully employing other inspectors who need help with their phone because they're not ringing and you're making money, staying at home. You could, 
you could you could operate a home inspection business from the beach and not do one not pick up one flashlight <laughs> being in business is a lot of fun but you just need resources and those resources internet is built to provide all the things that you need to be a successful home inspector that's why that's what that sign says i mean this isn't just we're not this isn't a catchy phrase Internet was built by home inspectors for home inspectors. And we have everything you need all in one place. So if you are missing something in your business, guess where you can go? Right here, Internet We'll figure it out for you. We've got consultants, we've got a marketing team, seven full time, highly creative, intelligent, caring illustrators and marketing design people and consultants and they only work with home inspectors. You can go to Vistaprint and get your business card <laughs> designed. Um, Vistaprint is a very good business, but InterNACHI's marketing team works with exclusively home inspectors. We know what we're doing, right? So that's a business resource that you should take advantage of. The challenge in being in business is not utilizing the resources that are readily available to you and making good decisions, and we can help you with that kind of stuff. Terrence. Um, here we go. Hank, how much time might you allow for the one-year maintenance inspection, and do you foresee any assumed liability with this type of walkthrough inspection? Uh, <laughs> I, would, I would schedule one year. I'd go 365 days. I would, like, you know, you can open up a window for your client. They're going to be your neighbor. You can send them an email. You can send them a nice letter. I'd follow up. Um, all my past clients are like gold, right? I mean, you could sell a list of past clients. That's how much it is. Don't, but it's amazing to have a list of past clients. I, I'm just shocked how many home inspectors don't follow up with their past clients. They simply get paid, leave the kitchen, bye. Well, that's your neighbor, right? And that house needs to be inspected, and they don't know that. You have to communicate that every home needs to be inspected. We just went through, in the beginning of the class, why every home needs to be inspected. Not every home has a major defect, but some do. Millions of heating systems, millions of toilets out there, many, uh, so there's a lot of problems in our, in our homes. So there's a reason, there's a good reason to offer an annual maintenance inspection. I call it a checkup. You get your teeth checked up, you get your body checked up with your medical doctor, you should get your home checked up as well. And what I'm gonna do for you, this is what I'm saying to my client, what I'm gonna do for you is I'm gonna pencil in a year from now, I'll come back and do an annual maintenance and checkup. Um, it's $200 a year from now, but if you wanna schedule it now, it's only 75 bucks. Something like that. You're, you're scheduling a year in advance, and then you can schedule another year, and call it an annual, and, and another year, another year, and another year, they'll probably move. That's a great job, uh, business model. Uh, what was the other one? Liability, there's no liability. What, well, no more than a home inspection. I mean, a home inspection, you're, you're looking at five, seven, eight hundred things. During a checkup, you're just, you know, you can write a standards of practice. You can write, um, you can write an agreement that sets the expectation of what this type of inspection is all about. It's not a home inspection, it's a, it's an abbreviated inspection. So you can just write, I'm going to inspect this, that, that, and I'm going to inspect these 12 things. Real quick, bup, 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 bup. out, half hour, 75 bucks, half hour, done. You don't even have to do it. Have your um, employee home inspector do them all. Do what, how many a day? Half a dozen? Half a dozen times, eh, that's a lot of money. Um, Glad you don't live next to me. <laughs> well, that's, you should find your local friends, your local home inspector friends, right? Hang out with them. We have um, chapters all over the world. Um, and there are other groups on Facebook, so uh, you can meet online um, and hang out with each other and bump ideas. One of the best reasons to go to a chapter is to um, rub elbows with everybody, but also kind of gauge yourself 
with your friendly competitors. You know, kind of see where you are. Are you behind or are you ahead? If you're ahead, you know, you keep going to these chapters and you seem to be ahead and you're, you're always having good news to share and they're always having bad news to share, then you need to step up and take the lead and really push the industry where it should go. You've got to raise these prices because you, you all provide incredible value and you need to help other inspectors be gainfully employed. If your phone's ringing off the hook, um, the purpose of marketing, what's the purpose of marketing? What is the purpose of marketing? I'll tell you. Purpose of marketing isn't to fill your calendar with work. That is not the purpose of marketing. The purpose of marketing is to create so much demand for your service that your calendar is overflowing, that you're choking on the work that's coming in. You don't know what to do with it. And you have to decide. Do I raise my fee in order to throttle this demand? Or do I keep my fee at about that and the demand and the overflow? I manage others. That's the purpose of marketing. Purpose of marketing is just to stay busy. Oh, I'm busy today. I've got a full week scheduled. No. It's to be overflow. It's to have this phone ringing off the hook. I'm so old that you know, phones used to hook on a wall and they, if you rang a lot, it would fall off. That's where the phrase comes from. The phone should be ringing off the That's why you need online scheduling. So you can't possibly take all these phone calls. You need a place to, you need a system in place to allow you to um, conduct business without you doing it yourself. So online scheduling is a great thing to do. That's the purpose of marketing. So if you and I, Raul, were in the same market, we probably have a grand old time competing with each other. You would be flying drones and I'd be trying to figure out how am I gonna beat him? How am I gonna beat her who's doing this amazing infrared scan of the attic space? Oh, you know, I have to figure out how I'm gonna beat him who includes some kind of home energy report with every inspection. Oh, it only forces all of us to do better, to compete. So that's, that's a little, sorry to go off on a tangent there. Is there a standard set of fees for differently ancillary answer, answer inspections? No, the, the fees are set by a math problem. So Donald is asking, essentially, how do I calculate how do I calculate a profitable fee? I'm gonna tell you. Nachi.org slash education. Nachi, N-A-C-H-I dot O-R-G slash education. And here's a free online course open to everyone. You don't even have to be a member of InterNACHI. You could be a non-member. You could be uh, on the weekend. You could have a different kind of profession and you can just learn about home inspection business. Type in business into the search box here at natchi.org slash education and over here boom home inspection business course you click that if you're not a, not a guest if you're not registered yet you have to do that you click uh, take the course and you log in and chapter 11 chapter 11 is calculate pricing and billing how to calculate pricing it's math and here's the equation desired annual salary plus overhead, plus desired annual profit, divided by annual billable hours equals billable hourly rate. And if you are working a five hour a day, well, you get your rate. You, have to, you can calculate profitable inspection fees based upon math, not on guessing. Ta da My competitors who guessed what to price their inspection fees were out of business within a couple years because their phone would ring with a cheap price that they just couldn't sustain. They, were charging, they weren't charging enough. You have to charge enough. What is enough? Well, you have to calculate it. It's math. Then when you do that hard work in, the, in chapter 11, just go through chapter 11 and take you a half hour and you'll know exactly what to charge. When, you, when the phone rings, you know that this is a profitable inspection. You can just say, yes, I will do that job for you on Saturday morning, 8 o'clock. See you then. Bye.
Boop. Kind of relieves the burden. At the end of the year, not, you're not guessing whether you had a successful year or not. So write your inspection report as you inspect. Let's do the, oh, wait, more questions? Starting out, um, starting, Skip asks, starting out, does a pay per report software work? Yeah, that's what I would do. And also, join InterNACHI per month, $49, and you get an entire month access to everything that every InterNACHI member has. Just try it out, right? See what we have to offer. You wanna do another month? Do another $49, pay a little bit. I mean, the yearly fee is best, but uh, if you're a non-member and you want to join InterNACHI today, contact me and I'll give you a link, and it's 50% off the yearly fee. But I would go, yeah, I wouldn't invest in a lot of tools. I, we talked about infrared. That's 500 bucks that you do not yet need to invest, but I highly recommend it later. Here's what you need. Flashlight. <laughs> uh, you can get this at inspectorcoach.com or inspectoroutlet.com. Um, a voltage tester, tick, tick, so that if you touch a wire, you know if it's live or dead, and a GFCI tester. That's what I would do. These three things, maybe 100 bucks for all three. Um, microwave leak detector, you can get one off of an inspector outlet. I think they're a couple bucks. Um, and that's about it. And then you move up. You know, you get your moisture meter. I like this. This is a gardening tool. This is a three-tine hoe. Three-tine, tine, 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 tine. I heated up this one and bent it straight so that you could, um, it's extendable, you could poke things with it, right? You can poke things and leave this one curled so that if you move insulation, you can put it right back and no one knows. You're not required to move insulation, by the way, but I did. Because sometimes you pull the insulation at a band rim joist where the deck is attached to the house and there's missing flashing. Hmm. So um, that's another tool. I think this is on inspectorcoach.com at the tools tab. And then you can invest in other things like crazy marketing that's really unique. So this is a lunchbox and it says, thank you for allowing us to inspect your home. Take a look inside and you leave this for the seller. What are they gonna be? What's on oh, your business card is on the other side. We really appreciate you. That's really nice. And oh, what's inside? It could be any, I don't know. Candy? It's up to you. It's really up to you. And then here's what's what's inside here. Oh, um, why hire a home inspector? So it says thank you for allowing me to inspect your home. That's from the marketing. All this is from the marketing department and inspector outlet and the coach. Another thing I would buy is um, I wouldn't get branded t-shirts right off the bat. Um, this is, I think, five bucks. It identifies you as a home inspector. It has internet on the front. It's kind of cool. I'd get that first. You know, there's a low investment, low entry into um, building a home inspection business. Don't invest too much. Software probably the most expensive thing, unless the state requires, if you're in a regulated state, like some kind of insurance or something like that, then those, those fees. I'm talking about other things. So I would go with the monthly stuff. And um, I'm not familiar. I'm only familiar, I think Spectora does monthly. Um, that's a good software. When you say you're writing report as you go, does your software already have pre-written material? Yes. So Home Gauge, Home Inspector Pro, 3D, all the really good top Spectora, top software companies have incorporated the InterNACHI standards of practice into a template. It should say InterNACHI residential template or something like that in the software. And it already has stuff that's already written. You just add to it. So type sentences that you would want to say in your report upon observing something. So. If the template doesn't have, let's say, um, a sentence about an observation about the water stain, remember the water stain? Or let, let's say there's a hole in the roof. So make it really easy, right? Major defect, hole in the roof. There's a hole in the roof. So you take a picture. Imagine yourself doing an inspection. You take a picture, click, you do a video, 
Rick, hey, there's a hole in the roof. This needs to be uh, corrected by a roofing professional. This is a major defect. Click. And then you want to type a sentence. You look at the sentence. Where is that sentence? Oh, there it is. Just tap it, and that pops that sentence that there's a major defect, hole in the roof, needs to be corrected. That sentence is popped in right at the picture that you took in the report itself. So you got to try it. It's hard for me to explain it, I guess. I have done classes with um, writing reports on mobile devices, and it's kind of clear that way, but we won't do that right now. But yeah, you got to just try it out. Most of the really, I think all of them, have free trial periods or free uh, report um, minimums, maximums. Um, so you, know, you should be able to try the software out first. Um, so I'm learning, actually. I've learned HomeGage, Home Inspector Pro, 3D, and now I'm learning Spectora. Um, Dorian, I'm trying to <clears throat> start a business right now, and my question is, how do I get my very first inspection because everybody's looking for experience? Not everybody's looking for experience. That's what you may hear from experienced inspectors. <laughs> Uh, I just talked to a fella who came from Colorado Springs, I think it was Colorado Springs, and he visited here and we were talking about business and how to start off, and he had that same question. And I said, don't hide it. I mean, when you're green, you're green. But that could be an advantage. Turn lemon into lemonade. So what do you do is you go to a real estate agent and say, you know, I'm new and I'm willing to provide this kind of value for you. I'll do a free inspection for every one of your listings. Your current listings, you have homes right now? You have a home coming up? Let me inspect it so that you can not be surprised by the next home inspector coming in and negotiating things. Let me find the problems and you guys fix it, and then you put it up as move-in certified, right? Experience inspectors kind of like frown upon this, I don't know why. New inspectors do this a lot. We inspect the home before it's put on market. Um, experienced inspectors are busy. They're doing two jobs a day, like me, right? I don't have time to spend a little extra time with your clients. You, t you do. Experienced inspectors tend to be older, and they're not really into the technology. You are, so you could add value per by providing a different way of delivering a delivery, a different way of delivering your reports, or bundling, or have your uh, bundling inspection um, services, or having a really nice modern website with modern features like online scheduling. There's a lot of things you could do. You could ask as a green inspector, an in experienced inspector, real estate agents. Um, I got this from Inspector Coach in her, in her. Um, she wrote marketing tips for marketing tips to market to real estate agents and home buyers. And one of the things you could say is you could approach a real estate agent and say, um, that she wrote paragraphs. Let me see if I can remember. The recommendation was to approach a real estate agent as a new inspector and say, I know that you're already working with several home inspectors, but I was wondering if you could help me find a real estate agent in your office who's having difficulty finding inspectors who do not work on the weekends, right? As a new inspector, I work on the weekends because I'll take any job, right? If phone's ringing, I'm going. I'm saying yes. So you could approach um, professional, experienced, top agents who already have their set of home inspectors and approach them in a way that um, doesn't say, hey, I'm a new inspector, take a look at my report, I'll do an inspection for you. You say, I already know you're working with other, but do you know of other agents in your office who ha are having problems with home inspectors who don't offer a buyback guarantee? Where if there's a mistake, Internet she will buy the home back. She or he will be like, hmm, uh, yeah, I do have people in my office who uh, want a weekend inspector. Um, come with me, what is, what is your name again? Right? So there are different ways. I wouldn't worry too much about it.
I think um, when I before I go to a movie, I look at the preview and I play it. You could have that, right? When I before I go to a restaurant, I like to look at the menu, take a picture. I mean, look at pictures of the food that I'm about to buy at the restaurant. That's how I shop. I think that's how most people shop. They want to go to a website that kind of gives a preview of who you are. And on your website, I don't think that the word experience needs to be on there. <laughs> if you're internationally certified as a home inspector, you have the skill set to do a wonderful home inspection according to a standards of practice, just like everybody else. So I would attain certifications and then I would practice like crazy on your own home, friends' home, neighbor's home, family home, families, members' homes, all for free and get really good at doing inspections because you're already certified and trained, you know the knowledge, now you have to apply that knowledge to get skills, abilities and skills and write a really good report. Once you're up to there, I can't tell a difference between a home inspector who's been in business for 10 years and a home inspector who just got certified. I think that's to your advantage. Wouldn't worry too much about it. Get trained and certified. Tell your client about the summary report when you are done and they decide not to buy this house. How many have decided not to pay you for the report? Oh, none. I can't, I have never run after a client. Let me think. Yeah, I don't think so. You know why? Because before I step onto the property, we've already agreed to certain things and there's a signed contract that I have. And they don't get the report until they pay me. So I think I have two things set up for me. Remember, you have to have systems in place to make your life easy. One is online scheduling where they agree to your terms and conditions in a contract to hire you. And they have to pay, then I do the inspection, right? You don't pay me until after the inspection, but you don't get the report until you pay me. Did I say that right? You don't pay me, I do the inspection, we, we do, I don't step on the property unless we have a signed contract, right? That helps redu reduce my liability and locks me in with you. You agree to pay me. I do the inspection, you don't pay me until it's all over. And then if you want the report at the end of the inspection, I have to get a credit card up from you. It has to go through. So I'm striking at the um, time of the inspection or if it's online scheduling and you have the guts to do this, you can ask for a credit card to secure your appointment. So you can take their credit card information. It doesn't transact it until after the inspection is done and the report is released. So I've never, with those two things in mind, I've never had to run after somebody. You know, I don't give the report until they pay. Um, let's see. I like that. I was saying my stay. Um, no name. Didn't enter your name? You okay? Licensing in my state requires 50 home inspections to qualify for a license. If unlicensed, how do you do inspections? Difference between certified and licensed. Difference between certified and licensed is um, if you attain a state license, that means you're just as good as everybody else. For veterans hate that because a new person comes up, gets a license, and they're equally qualified. You spent 20 years getting your market dominated by your business. Here comes a new person with a license and you're equally qualified in the eyes of the state. The other way around is if I'm new, I can become equally qualified <laughs> to everybody else just by attaining a state license. That's what license means. Being certified means you have attended an accredited school. And I only know of one home inspection school. It's an international school that's accredited by the U.S. Department of Education. And you become certified. And you put that certification on everything. That's different. Not everybody is certified. I wouldn't hire anybody who isn't internationally certified. Licensing in my state requires 50 inspections to qualify for a license. If you don't know how to get those 50 inspections, I wonder what state, I can't remember any state with 50 requirements. If you can't get those 50, and if it's not like, if the state didn't provide you a path or alternative path, 
to attaining those 50 inspections that are by a supervised, supervised uh, individual, um, you should complain really loud with other home inspectors, right? So something's up. There must be a step-by-step -step procedure written out by the state in order to do that. And um, yeah, so I would go to the state and complain. That's, that's your right to complain. Does, this, does the software store information on the device for those areas without good cellular reception and then later? Yes. Can you be a good inspector without construction background? Yes. Without the construction background, how hard will passing a national exam for a regulated like West Virginia? I would take InterNACHI's home inspector exam. It's an accredited exam, accredited by the U.S. Department of Education. I don't know of any other home inspector exam that's accredited by the U.S. Department of Education. And I would take that. It's free and online and open to everybody. And it will tell you at the end of the exam where you're strong and where you're weak. And where you're weak, it will provide you a link to strengthen that weakness. It's the greatest exam on the planet for a home inspector. And it doesn't cost a thing. And you can take it over and over again. It's really amazing. That's the first thing I would do. Um, about your state exam, I would complain to your state if you don't know the process of taking their state exam and if they don't have adequate preparation materials that are free, provided by the state, to the examinees. Um, okay, let's go. Exterior. We're on the exterior. We haven't even gotten to the juicy stuff yet in the basement. So on the exterior, again, we talked about this. I go counterclockwise. And I take pictures of everything and I inspect everything. That's rotten. That's a defect. I'm taking pictures of um, all the torn screens. Here's a torn screen. Here's um, a small roof on the side of the house. Here's the side of the house, vinyl siding. Up there, it looks good, no defects. Here's a system that, is, um, that comes up when I'm inspecting the exterior, it's the electrical. The electrical meter box is here. So it's very easy to switch systems if you're using a mobile device and write the report. So I'm doing the exterior. I simply click, click. I go to the electrical system and I start clicking my sentences. Meter is on the right side of the house. Attached, the service entrance cable is in good condition. Now I see a grounding wire. I see a grounding rod, telephone, internet cable, all here, good, next. So there's the meter, there's the line, going to the panel, there's the grounding wire, grounding rod, uh, water faucet, it's not frost free. In a cold climate, water faucets on the outside of the house, hose bibs they're called, need to be frost free so that they don't freeze and burst. And there's the water meter sensor. Another torn screen, window screen. The grating around the property is pretty good. There's the porch, enclosed deck in the back. Not worried about the foundational cracks. Another torn screen, another water faucet that needs to be replaced with a frost-free hose bib. There's the deck, small deck. I walk upon the deck. Oh, spindles. When this house was built, the deck requirement um, was different, right? So this house, this deck was built to code back then. I don't care. We're not allowed to um, have small, we shouldn't allow small children to fall through deck spindles, and so that space in between the spindles needs to be closer um, so that a four-inch sphere can't pass through it. And there's some wood rot and cracking of the railing of the deck there. Took a picture of it. That'll be in the report. There's the dryer vent. I could see the louvers are stuck because there's lint clogging the louvers. So there's something wrong there. That's a fire hazard. And that needs to be cleaned and serviced. And then my annual inspection, I'll follow up on that, make sure that that is actually cleaned. Underside of the deck, floor joists, deck posts, beams, ledger board, floor joists, attachment, flashing, all looks pretty good. There was a, a sealant uh, applied to the foundation wall. I'm gonna ask the seller, because I can't see the entire crack in the foundation wall, I'm gonna ask the seller Someone patched it. I'm going to ask this, my client to ask the seller for more information. 
I'm not a structural engineer. I'm not going to comment on the structural integrity of it. I'm going to report upon the observed condition that is a crack, a crack was observed, and a patch on the crack was observed. Sewer line on the side of the deck, just taking pictures. Oh, the deck steps are leaning in this picture, so they're um, resting on ground that settled, and so the deck steps have settled. So that's a trip hazard. And hair, handrails, love picking on handrails, especially for the exterior. Code says handrails are required for stairways with four or more risers, and there's a link to the code. It's in chapter three under the building planning chapter. It's section R311, R311.7.8, handrails. And it says handrails are required for stairways with four or more risers, and that's the 2018 International Residential Code. Pfft. I'm not a code inspector. Guess what? If I see two steps, I'm calling for a handrail. One, two. Well, how can I do that? I'm not a code inspector. That's why. I'm a home inspector. If I think that's not safe for my grandmother to go up steps, what, my grandmother can't have a handrail unless there's five or four? Four or more risers? Forget that. How about this one? There's no way someone is going to walk that up there who has difficulty. There's, there's one, two, three, and then into the door. For me, that's four. Four steps, there should be a handrail there. If you count it as three, there should be a handrail there. If, if I count it and there's two steps, there should be a handrail there. So people with um, needs have to have a handrail there. And when I'm old and I can't get my foot up, yeah, I'm going to need a handrail there. So that's the difference between being a code inspector and a home inspector. It's a lot of fun being a home inspector. You can just use code as reference. Steps are leaning. That needs to be fixed. There's the air conditioner. Well, it's an outdoor con compressor unit. I'll call it condenser, compressor. So we'll see if it's an air conditioner or a heat pump. Manufacturing label, I take a picture of every manufacturing label. Some manufacturing labels are great because it tell you the size or the date or at least the model number is there. So I take a picture of every manufacturing label that I can. And if you have a manufacturing label and you want to know actually the date that it was built, this website, I don't know who made it. It's a great website. I came across it years ago. I still use it. They updated it. It's really good. Building-center.org building-center.org, and you can find out HVAC um, ages, when um, the age of the HVAC system, heating and air conditioning system that you're um, inspecting, heat pumps, air conditionings, uh, gas-fired furnaces, et cetera, and the age of water heaters, electric water heaters, gas-fired water heaters, and recalls. So this is a great free service. This is a, I'll go here. Can I go here? I'll be darned, I can't get, well, we'll have to go, oh, I know. Let's see, uh, let's see, arrange, back, back, boom, okay. So we'll go here, and this is the website, um, and there's big three buttons, HVAC age, water heater age, and recalls. And you type in the model number. So if it's HVAC, um, and I don't know, I'm just going to go to the A's. And if it's uh, um, AirQuest, what does AirQuest mean? Uh, you need the serial number, and there's styles of the serial number. And if it's this style, that means this age. So there are ways to look up the age of the HVAC, the water heater, and things like that using that um, website, building hyphencenter.org. You don't have to use it. I don't care. I just came across it and I think it's a great website. Um, and it's all free information. That's what I love. So if you wanted to dive deep into detail, you're not required to um, estimate the age of anything in a home according to the standards of practice. But if you wanted to, um, there's some resources available. Even recalls. 
So there's uh, me inspecting the suction line, and refrigerant line, and there's electrical disconnect. The fins on the um, unit are damaged. That's going to reduce the performance. They could be fixed. Uh, I'm not going to make a big deal out of it, but I'm certainly going to put it in a report as an observation um, so that my client understands. And then it's an older unit. And then um, there's more pictures of the exterior, garage door flashing. The driveway looks great. There's where I park. You can see I don't block the driveway. I kind of pull up right next to it, right in front, and um, park there. And my tools are pulled out of the side of the van right there. And as you can tell, I, I used to carry a really tall ladder, so I, um, that was part of my brand. So if Raul, if you and I were in, uh, competing against each other in the same market, you would have to figure out how to beat me with this big ladder rack of ladders. And more inspection pictures of the rear enclosed deck, like the screened in porch deck with, that we have with the roof. All exterior receptacles are GFCI protected, so that's a picture of my GFCI tester, me testing it. And 815, I'm done with the exterior. 815 and 915, I'm gonna do the big stuff. So let's go through this. Here's the HVAC system. Ah, it's not fuel fired. <clears throat> It's a heat pump. There's a refrigerant line, suction line, and there's the York unit there with a humidifier. There's York. There's the suction line. It's large diameter line, insulated. Liquid line is there. There's the manufacturing date. Again, I take a picture of it. The heating coil for backup heat is on the top. The ductwork turned on. I didn't, I turned on the heat, let it cool, turned on the air conditioner, let it cool. That's about it. I touch the ductwork actually with my hand just to see if there's a temperature difference. You can take the temperature difference and um, you can quantify things if you wanted to. I never did. In Texas, I think you have to quantify the temperature of the air coming into the unit and the temperature coming out. There has to be a delta T, a difference in temperature. Um, and you could do that if you don't want to quantify. I basically just went around every room and found the supply register um, and uh, laser beamed it and took a measurement of it. So um, you could see, I don't know if you could see, can you see that? Yeah, so that's a, a beam. That's a, you can see, yeah. Let's see, I don't know how to, oh, yeah. So taking the temperature, and that's 91 degrees. Oh, running hot. Um, there's the coil, it's kind of neat. I was able to open that up, take a look. Condensate, condensate pump, discharge pipe, air filter. There's the condensate pump there. So basically, this is a, a heat pump system with a bunch of components. So I inspect systems. I take a picture of the system, and then I move in. I get a little bit closer, and I take another picture of the system, and then I move in, and I inspect the components of the system. And now I'm touching all the components of the system um, and taking a picture of it. So I can't mess up because I'm holding my software device, my mobile software, and it tells me what to inspect. Because I wrote, Pat, this is what you're supposed to inspect on a heat pump system. Check this first, do this second, check this third, check this fourth, say this, if that's there, and if that is there, say that. I can't mess up. So when you're inspecting with a mobile device, it's like a cheat sheet on what to do, and what to say, and how to say it, and what to inspect. It's really great. There's the humidifier, that filter is nasty, that has to be replaced every year. There's the hot water source coming to the hot water tank, and that goes to the refrigerator upstairs with a little valve. Um, th that, that goes, um, that's a supply on top of the hot water tank. And that one goes through either the refrigerator or the humidifier, actually it's the humidifier because I'm on that system, sorry about that. So that's the valve to the humidifier. And there's a control for the humidifier. And there's a shot of the um, HVAC service record. So I take a picture of the service record and I put it in the report. If the unit, if the system hasn't been serviced and cleaned by a professional in the past 12 months, guess what my recommendation is? Yep. It also had some electric baseboard heaters, so I turned them on and I touched them. You could also laser beam them. Um, with this laser, and you don't have to touch every 
radiator fin. You can just beam it. Because I'm trying to, I'm not skipping anything, but I'm being efficient with my time. Hot water source, electric hot water tank, brand new, no problems at all. There's a date, there's a side, uh, size on the manufacturing label, Bradford White. Cold water coming in through a shutoff valve, hot water coming out. TPR valve extended to the floor, looks good. How do I know it's good? Well, the 2018 International Plumbing Code, section 504.6, has the 12 requirements for discharge piping from a TPR valve, and it's really cool. Um, one of them is, see, I'm not a code inspector, but I use standards and codes and practices to make um, my job really easy and my reports very valuable. So if I can go to water heaters, chapter five, and it's 504, requirements for discharge piping. The discharge piping serving a pressure relief valve, temperature relief valve, or combination thereof shall, one, not be, direct, not be directly connected to the drainage system. I actually saw a TPR valve coming from a hot water tank and they pumped it into the sewer line, the drainage line. I taught a class on that. It's a great picture. Um, the, the discharge cannot discharge, oh, sorry. The, the temperature relief valve shall discharge through an air gap located in the same room as the water heater. So if it discharges, let's say it discharges in a, another room, like it, the discharge pipe goes through the wall and it discharges outside or in another room, that's no good has to discharge through an air gap located in the same room as the water heater. Um, it must discharge to the floor, to the pan serving the water heater or storage tank, to a waste receptor, or to the outdoors. Ah, that's great. Um, it must not be trapped. It must discharge to a termination point that's readily observable by the building occupants. Yep, because it has to be conspicuous. You have to see it. If there's a problem with the temperature pressure relief valve and it's dripping, somebody ought to know that. And how are you gonna know that if you can't see it? It has to be conspicuous. It has to be readily observable. That's why it has to discharge in the same room as the water heater. Um, and this is the one I like. Must be installed so as to flow by gravity. So you can't have a discharge pipe going up or even level, I would say, it has to be sloped so it can be um, so the water can flow by gravity and it must terminate not more than six inches 152 millimeters above and not less than two times the discharge pipe diameter above the floor or flood level rim of the waste receptor hmm terminate not more than six inches above so if the tpr valve comes out at the top of the hot water tank and just bends over a little bit the edge of the hot water tank and stops there someone's gonna get scalded all over the body. It has to go all the way down to, the, well, almost all the way down to the floor. Not more than six inches above the floor. And not less than two times, not less than two times the, two times the discharge pipe diameter above the floor. So it can't be touching the floor. It has to be, you know, uh, you know, like a little bit above the floor and not too much. <laughs> okay, so there are 12 actually 12 requirements for a TPR valve. How am I gonna remember that during a home inspection? I already told you. The mobile device, right? So bring that with you. You can write notes to yourself. Uh, water supply, cold water coming in, pressure relief valve, so we need an expansion tank. That's in the plumbing course if you wanna know more about check valves and hot water expansion. Um, there's the meter, there's a jumper cable, there's a main shutoff valve, you have to identify that for your client, and there's the access to it. That's good. And the drain waste pipe is PVC in this one, and there's a four inch pipe, and there's the clean out. Pretty good. Um, that's all I could inspect. I took two pictures of the pipes that I could see. Everything else is hidden, which comes to the question, are you required to inspect everything? No. Are you required to find every defect or house issue? No. You're not required to find all the problems in a home. It's impossible. You're only required to do what the standards of practice requires you to do. And the main defect, the single defect that you are required to put in your report 
is a material defect, but you have to both observe it and deem that defect to be, consider that defect to be material as it's defined by the standards of practice. So there could be a material defect behind this wall right here that I'm touching with my hand, and I'm not required to put it in a report. I can't see it. I have to both observe it and consider that defect to be a material defect. There could be something nasty right behind this. Can't see it. Can't see it with my infrared camera. Can't see it with my flashlight. Can't see it until, well, maybe the contractor rips open the wall. Oh, there's a defect in the wall. Well, a lot of contractors will say, oh, that home inspector should have seen that. No. We do visual home inspections, which means essentially that I put both the hands behind my back and I tie them and I walk through the home and that's it. It's a visual only inspection. That means I'm only using my eyes, right? So don't worry about phone calls saying, hey, you did an inspection two months ago. We ripped open, we uh, tore out the carpeting and now we find fill in the blank. Don't worry about that. As long as you have your inspection agreement signed and you have the standards of practice referenced and you've performed a home inspection according to the standards of practice and your inspection report is written well. Um, 915 to 10, electrical. Do not remove the dead front cover off the electrical panel. Identify the service if it's labeled, readily labeled, and it, it is here, it's 200 amps. I have a couple breakers that are in the off position. I don't know why, but I'm put, on the, put that in the report. The breakers are not specifically identified either, so we don't know what's going on. Don't ever reset a breaker if it's off or tripped off. So we need the breakers to be identified and an explanation about that breaker. I remove the dead front cover. Again, it's um, fatal if you do something in that electrical panel that you're not supposed to do, right? Um, so don't remove it. You're not required to remove it. I did on this inspection, took a look inside and tried to find out something well, I have two breakers here that are double tapped. So I have two wires going into the breakers. So I like to see one wire going into each breaker. Um, and then we have the answer to the breakers that are in the off position. They're not even wired up. So there's no, connect, um, there are no conductors there. Other than that, it's okay. Plenty of room, good panel, no problems. Those two. Double taps, no big deal. GFCI protection, modern NMB wiring. Okay, the structure. Remember that crack on the outside that was foamed or sealed? I'm gonna put that in the report and I'm gonna try to find it here on the inside. So I'm looking around, I see the crack. There's another crack in the corner. So there's a couple cracks. So the poured concrete foundation cracks when it cures, that's okay. As long as it doesn't displace, move, separate, settle, all that good stuff. A crack can allow water to come through, so even if it's hairline, water could come through and they could seal it up. Um, the sealant, usually, if it's done professionally, the sealant itself is stronger than the concrete, um, has a strength that's conger, stronger than concrete, so um, it, it's a really nice epoxy sealant. So I just want more information. I'm not a structural engineer. I just report the observed indications of, and you insert whatever your observations are. There's my moisture meter, Hydro Shark, right? It's kind of a cool tool. Let's me go around the perimeter. Of the basement and do this. I'm just looking. I don't, I'm not doing every inch. I don't even have to do any of the, oh, sorry, like this. I'm not doing every inch of the floor. I don't even have to do this. I'm not required to use any tool, really. Not even the word flashlight appears in the standards of practice, if you notice. If you're using a, a flashlight during a home inspection, I guess one could argue you're exceeding the standards of practice. So this tool is for me to you know, know what's going on. If there's anything going on below, through the carpeting, maybe into the into the floor sheathing, the decking, the wooden decking, or the concrete floor. It's kind of a neat tool to have. You're not required to use it. I wouldn't buy it. It's costly. It's probably 
forty dollars or something. Um, don't need it in the beginning if you're just starting off, but it's kind of neat to have afterwards. I found it really handy. Again, inspectorcoach.com. Smoke detectors. Any smoke detector that's yellow <laughs> it should be replaced. So um, I'm really hard on smoke detectors. I think when you move into a new home, you want the peace of mind of having new smoke and carbon monoxide detectors in every bedroom, in every hallway, on every floor, everywhere that's required. So with battery backup, hardwired battery backup are the best. And then I test the receptacles with my tester. That's a broken glass at the basement window. Put that in the report. This inspection picture of personal stored items helps me to describe the limitations of my visual only inspection if I have to. This picture is worth a thousand words. I can't see everything. Um, and I'm not required to move items. So there's a lot in my way. 10 o'clock, I'm basically, in my head, done. I feel really great. I did the heavy lifting, roof, exterior, all the stuff down in the basement, all the big systems, and including the structure. And now I'm in the attic, unfinished attic space. I didn't have any problems. Do you remember when I was on the roof? I didn't see any cracks in the roof covering materials, no holes in roof covering materials, no flashing problems. So I really shouldn't see a whole lot going on inside here. I have vents, the soft vents. There's trays protecting the openings and the ridge vent, remember that? And there I saw the gable vent. That's pretty good. A lot of insulation, thick insulation. According to the climate zone, I may be able to um, recommend more, adding more insulation, right? And I also see some wooden components here with some thermal bridging issues that could be addressed by adding more insulation on top. And we talked about um, insulation and climate zones and recommendations earlier in the class. And there we go. That's probably the ceiling of the garage there. So I'm taking a look at that structure and that ceiling does not need to be insulated. It looks good. Laundry, GFCI receptacles required. I like um, a pan underneath the clothes washer. I like braided mesh hoses. There's the dryer vent it needs to go outside. Can't be more, uh, 35 feet is now the new standard, um, but there are exceptions and there are um, some mathematical calculations on those. Uh, there's the plug there. Uh, inspecting the interior, another 15 minutes. It doesn't take very long to do the entire interior. Ceilings, walls, floors, bathrooms. Uh, flush the toilet. Uh, S trap, no big deal. P trap, that's good. GFCI receptacles in every bathroom, test those, reset them before I leave. I run the shower, run both hot and cold at the sink fixture, and then I flush the toilet. And then I take a look at the shower head flow. If it's inadequate flow, I'll comment upon it. If not, it should be good to go. There's the handle inside the shower, tub. I put my foot near the edge of the tub to see if there's any water damage to the flooring in the corners. I use the side of my leg to see if the toilet um, water closet is attached to the floor, if it needs a new wax seal, open and close the windows and doors, and then the interior. So smoke detector, yellow, I'm gonna call that out. Another bathroom, second floor bathroom. So I'm taking a lot of pictures here, going through a lot of pictures, about probably another 30 pictures of the interior, including bathrooms. If there's a a plumbing access panel, I'll open it up and take a look at the back side of the shower and tub. Um, sometimes there'll be a leak and it won't manifest itself on the ceiling below. But when I'm on the first floor and there's a second floor bathroom, I certainly look at the ceiling of the first floor directly underneath that second floor bathroom. Little trick that I do. Um, I take a look at for settlement where the doors close within the frame. The frame, the door itself, if it hasn't been shimmed or shaved, should be square. And if it's scraping up against the door frame opening, then that means the wall has shifted a little bit. And no big deal, but um, could be an, um, some, uh, some evidence of settlement. Uh, it could be normal, too. So I, I 
wouldn't freak out on a door that has a, a sticky corner. Um, steps, interior steps should have handrails, so I shake them. Um, a handrail, a guard, uh, a railing should hold 200 pounds in any direction, so I give it a good pull and push. Here's the first floor half bath, GFCI. All bathroom fans should exhaust outside. All kitchen fans should exhaust outside. All dryer vents should terminate outside. There's the living room with the fireplace, factory built fireplace. I see creosote. I'm gonna, that's shiny um, black stuff. Um, the shiny black stuff is creosote that could be flammable. Um, the fireplace interior is okay, but um, I open and close the damper door that's required by the standards of practice. So I open and close it, but when I was doing that, I saw creosote. So I'm gonna call that out. And remember, the top of the chimney cap, remember earlier in the slides, earlier in the inspection, the top of the chimney cap was not diverting water away from the top of the chimney, it was puddling up with water. Here's the interior dining room, windows, there's the floor, interior key deadbolts can make an emergency exit hazardous. You can't have interior key deadbolts. Just imagine the house is filled with smoke and there's a fire and the deadbolt is locked and no one can find the key. So that's why um, this was built to code back then. So no one should say anything, well, this was built to code back then. This was grand, this is a grandfather thing. Mm -mm. Nope. So we apply modern standards and best practices and construction methods and code um, to um, current day. So when I'm inspecting this home, I could care less when the home was built. This home was built obviously to code back then. It is now a hazard. That is a defect. That needs to be replaced. And it's a, what, $20 item? Um, that's not gonna kill the deal. Uh, garage. Garage door openers. There's um, a 10-step checklist on how to inspect a garage door opener um, that's attached to a garage door. And uh, that's in our um, course, our free online course for home inspectors. And there's the the door opener, left master, there's the photoelectric eyes, a little too high. Uh, we don't want them higher than six inches, right? Um, and the windows, there's storage items in the way, I can't see everything. All garage receptacles should be GFCI protected. There's a fire hazard, so there's a, an attic access um, panel. It's wooden, and it's in the ceiling of the garage, which is a firewall breach. So if a fire starts in the garage, the fire department, fire marshal, the fire department, likes about a half an hour to get to the garage to put out the fire. If there's a breach in that firewall, like missing drywall tape, like I see there, or a hole like this where there's a wooden, um, there's a hole cut into the drywall and a piece of wood um, for a panel door, access door, is installed in its place, um, that's a firewall breach. That's a hazard, fire hazard. That may have been, I can't, can't I don't know about code back then, 20, 30 years ago. I don't think that was allowed, but let's say someone says, well, that was, grandf isn't that grandfather? I, again, it's um, good practice, it's not a requirement, it's good practice to keep it in mind to inspect a home, whether it's brand new or 50 years old, to inspect it without regard to the age of the home. So no one can argue with you whether or not that fire breach, according to modern code, is one. But it is. When the house is built, it really shouldn't be um, brought up in conversation. So there's a tape over the drywall seam, and that's a fire hazard. All seams in the drywall within the garage need to be taped up. Everywhere needs to be taped up. 10.30 or 10.45, I inspect the kitchen and I end it there. And I'm really excited, I'm in the kitchen, I'm gonna get paid and do a summary of the report. Um, and there's the garbage disposal, all GFCI receptacles. There's the island, I like to try to move and tilt the island, it should be secured to the floor. And it should have a receptacle as well. Um, and there's the dishwasher, I run a short cycle and there's the electric stove, range, oven, and exhaust. And I do a summary with my client, and then I swipe a credit card, or click a button uh, on my um, computer, and 
they get access to the report. And I print out the summary, I'll bring a printer in and I'll, I'll, I can print the entire report or the summary report, um, anything they want. And uh, usually they just want the summary printed so that they can have something to work on and negotiate over and get this done uh, within the next hour or two and have a reply, a formal reply about negotiation tip, um, items or not um, with the seller and start to, the real estate agents love to move towards closing. So um, that was a need. I asked real estate agents in my market area, what would be the highlights of you know, a really good home inspection service? And they all said that they want a checklist of things to work on at the end of the inspection report, a summary, print it out so that they can check, 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 check. So that's what I, that was the need and I provided that need. Um, the report looks pretty cool with all the pictures. So there's the beginning pages and there's the roof. We've seen these pictures before that I took and I didn't put all of the pictures in the report, but a lot of them. So there'll be maybe, you know, four, nine, four to nine pictures on every page. There's the damper. There's the exterior. So page 12 has pictures of the exterior. Page 15 is the heat pump. The fins are damaged. Air filter is clean. Hasn't been serviced in, in over a year. There's the water supply coming in. Hot water tank. There's the electrical on page 23. Breakers. Page 26 is the structure and the cracks about epoxy injection. And there's my moisture meter. Didn't find any. Didn't observe any indications of moisture intrusion at the time of the inspection. So there's um, the auto reversing functions are located higher than recommended six inches off the floor and the, the drywall is a fire breach. And then there's the laundry on page 31. So my inspection reports are pretty big. They have a lot of pictures. Page 33 is the attic, pretty good there. And then there's the bathrooms. Um, I clump all the bathrooms together. So all the bathrooms are in one section of the home inspection report. And there's the interior. Reference to the standards of practice, some illustrations to make my inspection reports look pretty. You can get those illustrations from the Internet G Inspection Gallery. And a report conclusion and walkthrough, and then a letter that I leave behind for every seller. And so that was a 47 page report. And that is the inspection and the inspection report. Um, let's see. Dina, the state requires 15 inspections as Maryland. Oh, so go to nachi.org, N-A-C-H-I dot org slash and enter your state or province or country. Just type it in one word. So if it's Washington, D.C., type in Washington, D.C. without any spaces. Um, for you, it would be nachi.org slash Maryland. And there's some resources for you probably there. So take a look at that. And N-A-C-H-I dot org slash Maryland. Um, let's see. Hank, would you first, uh, I'm just looking over the questions. Do we flush every toilet? Yes. Gave it in too close to it. Mentioned a lot about software. Which one is the most convenient to use? Mobile one. Look for mobile one. And look for, um, ask the software provider for an exclusive discount because you're a member of InterNACHI. And if you're a non-member of InterNACHI today, I can give you, and you want to join in, and actually for a year, I can give you a 50% off discount. Just email me, um, and that's at, let's see, we did this earlier. Where is that slide? There. So I'll give you a discount if you want to join in, actually, if you're attending this class and you're a non-member, non-members only, um, just email me, Bennett and Anachi. And then uh, to summarize, I want to thank you all 
go to Nachi TV, N-A-C-H-I dot TV for the next class. The video recording of this class is going to be up there in a couple days. It takes me a while. And then go to Nachi.org slash everything for everything that you need uh, all in one place if you can't find it. And um, that was fun. That was a fun class on how to perform a home inspection. I'm Ben Gromico from InterNACHI and NACHI TV. Have fun. I'll see you in the next class, okay? All right, everybody. Bye. Stay safe out there. Bye.